Welcome to the Peter King Podcast presented by Salesforce. We've got an action-packed pod post-championship game, pre-Super Bowl week. Uh, I'll be in Phoenix next week for the Peter King Podcast presented by Salesforce uh, with my partner in crime, Miles Simmons. I just want to get your quick reaction to the Andy Reid Super Bowl. What hits you when you first hear Kansas City versus Philadelphia? Well, the first thing is Andy Reid and just uh, how much he meant to the Eagles franchise for years and years and years and how competitive they continue to be and now how successful he has been with Kansas City. But as a Cleveland native, I know some people are going to get sick of this. But man, the Kelsey brothers participating in a Super Bowl against one another, that is something that is very, very special. And like I said, as somebody who also grew up in the suburbs on the east side of Cleveland, I, I take a lot of pride in that. I'm not going to lie to you, Peter. You know, I'll tell you, and that that's a good one. We'll definitely talk about that today, uh, this week in the pod. You know, the one other thing, I do want to discuss, and we are going to get into this a little bit later in the pod in more depth. I think it's very interesting that 35 years after I went to a Super Bowl in San Diego and Doug Williams made mincemeat uh, of the Denver Broncos in that Super Bowl, we now are to the point where, and I bring up Doug Williams because obviously you know, we got a lot of questions that week and even after the game about the historic nature of being a black quarterback in the Super Bowl. And now I didn't even realize it until about, I don't know, two o'clock Monday morning yeah. that Patrick Mahomes and Jalen Hurts, uh, because I saw it somewhere, uh, was going to be the first matchup of two black quarterbacks in the 57 years of Super Bowls. And one of the reasons I really didn't think about it is that it's become so natural. It's become so a part of the NFL fabric. I don't really think about the whole black quarterback issue so much anymore, but I consider that to be progress. We're going to get to that a little bit later in the pod, but let me just whip through all of our topics right now. Uh, number one, we obviously have the Andy Reid Super Bowl. We are going to dissect all the officiating crapola from this game uh, or from the weekend. We're going to talk about the 49ers and Brock Purdy and Josh Johnson and whether there should be a guaranteed third uh, quarterback uh, suited up for every game. We're going to talk about the Eagles and how they probably got a little bit fortunate in the last couple of weeks in what happened in those two games. Don't blame the Eagles. You know, they're playing <laughs> by the rules, obviously. And uh, it just so happened that they were advantaged in this particular case by their two opponents and, and what happened in those games. We're going to break down both title games. And because we're going to talk so much about the officiating at certain points of this pod. By the time we get to actually discuss the AFC game, I'd like it to be to discuss the game rather than, you know, whether you think Joseph Osai should have gotten flagged. He should have, uh, but we'll get into all of that. We're going to talk about the Dallas Cowboys coaching situation, uh, where the other coaching situations and by the coaching situation in Dallas I mean what Mike McCarthy has done in naming himself play caller what Kellen Moore could mean to the Chargers and obviously we'll just go down the other coaching situations as well but Miles when we start off I'm really curious when you look at this matchup to me I think it's a fascinating matchup because on the surface I I couldn't believe when the when the line came out. I thought it would be Eagles by six or something because they have just dominated uh, their two playoff games. 
And obviously, Kansas City struggled. They had a bit more of a struggle than we thought at home against Jacksonville. And obviously, it was pretty much anybody's game uh, to uh, in the championship game. I'll ask you this. What do you think of it, in essence, being kind of a pick em line? And now, I guess, you know, the Eagles are a, maybe a two-point pick or something. But look... It's whatever it is, it's insanely close. Tell me your thoughts about the perception of this. I kind of look at it like, man, I would really favor the Eagles in this game. Well, it's interesting, Peter, because I think some of that is just the factor of having Patrick Mahomes, right? And you have to figure that Patrick Mahomes is going to get his at some point in the game, whether he's playing on a bum ankle or not. And, and, you know, I thought the way he played basically aside from that one fumble that he had was really outstanding. And because of that, even when he's throwing to dudes that I've basically never heard of, and I follow the chiefs pretty closely because, you know, he's coming up off the practice squad. You're still seeing the effectiveness of Mahomes in that offense. And also on the other side, where you have somebody as dominant as Chris Jones and as well as he has been playing all season long, that's a fascinating deal where you're going to be seeing him against one of the best offensive lines, if not the best offensive line in football in the Philadelphia Eagles. So I I think that even though the Eagles have been great all year and they've really been dominant in some of these matchups that we see, not just in the playoffs, but in the regular season too, I I think that Kansas City can be really, really good, and they're very battle-tested, too, because the Jaguars were playing great football coming into this, uh, that game that they played um, last week um, with the Kansas City Chiefs in Kansas City. That was something that, you know, I, I didn't necessarily expect it to be a cakewalk for them, and it wasn't. And then, you know, the Bengals were also playing as good a football as anybody in the National Football League. And I thought that that would be a close nail biter. And it ended up being that. And that was really anybody's game. So I think it's two really good teams that we're going to see. And you just hope that the quarterbacks are going to be healthy enough that they can be effective, you know, and they can be at the height of their powers. So it was a week and a half ago after the Giants-Eagles game uh, when I spoke with Jalen Hurts after that game, and it was clear that, as he said, my my shoulder is, quote, good enough, Mm -hmm. end quote. And it was clear that he was still having some pain. Uh, Watching him uh, just on television on Sunday – It appeared as though he's still affected by his shoulder injury. Um, And I agree with you, Miles. I think there's no question uh, that, in essence, on Sunday, uh, the the Kansas City quarterback, Patrick Mahomes, entered that game with a what any athletic trainer will basically tell you is a six-week injury. Okay, Mm -hmm. a six week injury. That is what a high ankle sprain is. So Patrick Mahomes basically said, "Okay, I'm going to gut it out and I'm playing with this. He aggravated the high ankle sprain in that game on that run to the left that basically led my column this week in which I described it uh, and in which I described the uh, the uh, longtime head athletic trainer, Rick Burkholder going to Mahomes during a break in the action saying, you okay? And Mahomes saying, get away from me. Um, And so in essence, it still is a problem. And so I'm glad you brought that up. This should be a showcase for two of the best quarterbacks in football. And I just hope that it isn't a showcase for two of the best quarterbacks in football playing at 68%. Okay. Mm. And, and I just, I just am hoping that we see these, both of these guys somewhere near the peak of their powers. I'm, I'm skeptical that we will, particularly with Mahomes. I just don't think we're going to be able to see the same kind of uh, what we would have seen in mid October, which is basically Mahomes freely running all over the place and making so many things happen. I 
I sort of want to discuss something else about this matchup that I absolutely love. In this game, we had come into this AFC championship game believing, and and again, for right for, for, for better or for worse, believing that the Bengals had solved their offensive line issues, even though mm. they were playing with three uh, replacement guys on the line because they had played so well against the Buffalo Bills in the divisional game. And now I think what you saw is especially Frank Clark on his side of the line, along with Chris Jones, when they are together on the right side of a line, they are just hellacious to try to block. And then when Chris Jones moves over uh, to the left, to his left, over the Bengals' right guard, he just abused Max Sharping in this game. And, and so the Bengals' right guard. And, and so I just think that the one thing that I keep thinking about in this game, the Eagles have the state-of-the-art offensive line in football. And right now, the best matchup in this game, without any question, is Chris Jones and Frank Clark and their friends on the Kansas City front against this great Philadelphia offensive line. That, to me, is going to go a long way in determining who wins this game. Absolutely. I mean, and Chris Jones, too, on that last third and eight, absolutely destroys the right tackle with Denji on the way to getting to Joe Burrow and getting the ball back for Kansas City so that they can go down the field and kick that game-winning field goal. So, yeah, Chris Jones, I mean, Andy Reid has said it, and I know a lot of people have said it, but he has had an outstanding, outstanding 2022 season. And, you know, he never had a postseason sack until – this game in the AFC championship and, you know, he showed out, man, he really did. And so when you're talking about the Philadelphia Eagles, I think it's important to remember that Lane Johnson is still dealing with a pectoral injury that he decided to let heal, didn't have the surgery so that he could continue to play in the, in the postseason. And so I don't know how much that is or is not going to affect him. You know, when you get however many weeks out that it's been since it's, uh, he suffered the injury. But I, I think it's still something to monitor, especially given how well Frank Clark and Chris Jones have been playing right now. Yeah, I, I just, we're going to have a lot more of discussion about the game next week. Yeah, um, I do want to get into some of the officiating issues. And obviously we're going to spend some significant time on that this week because of the hue and cry about officiating. I want to start by talking about this, about officiating. So I've never been an officiating as boogeyman person about covering the National Football League. That's why I really didn't write about it much in my column. And I understood that there was going to be howls and hues and cries about officiating. But I think the way I look at it is this, that at the end of the day, although there is, as I referred to on Twitter on Monday of this week, I, I, the amount of QAnon type takes that I saw from people about the officiating uh, is just, to me, overwhelming and quite honestly sad, you know? If if you if you see a conspiracy theory in everything, you probably shouldn't watch sports. You just shouldn't. What fun could it be if, regardless of what the outcome is, you believe that the fix is in? And right. it is. I think it's preposterous, really. But you know, I do think there were some legitimate points made about. There have been some legitimate points made about officiating. And, and Miles, I want to discuss three distinct issues about officiating, okay? One is uh, whether the, the quote, all-star crews end up, uh, all-star crews, end quote, excuse me, uh, end up hurting the game uh, and hurting postseason games. 
And look, I'm not positive about this, but it does make a lot of sense that all-star crews really are not great for football games because essentially you're working with guys for the first time all year in what obviously for the guys who work the championship games, they won't be working the Super Bowl, none of them. So for the guys who work the championship games, that's the biggest game of their year. And they're working, they're not working with strangers, they know each other, but they're working with guys, most, most of them for the first time. And while it is true, all of these people, uh, you know, are all do the same jobs. You know, a headlinesman does what a headlinesman does. I do think in the form of communication that there can be some issues. And look, it is true. The Pro Football Referees Association really pushed hard in one of the recent negotiations for all-star crews. And they pushed hard for this because they thought that if a guy, if a field judge who worked for, or down judge, excuse me, who worked for, uh, in, a, in, a, in a crew where the referee got some downgrades or the back judge got some downgrades, and so therefore the crew wasn't graded collectively very highly, they shouldn't punish other guys on the crew who had a great year. Theoretically, that's correct. But I do think chemistry in crews can have an impact. And the one play I think about is the do-over play in the Cincinnati-Kansas City game where one official was just too late in blowing the play dead. And so therefore, the play was made. You know, Kansas City failed to convert on a third and nine. And then they got another chance and obviously did convert it. But be that as it may, you have any feelings about uh, about the all-star crews? Yeah, I, I kind of feel the way I feel like you do, which is that I don't know how great of an idea that they are just in terms of that chemistry and that communication, right? I mean, I think if you've worked together all year long and then you notice a mistake, you're not necessarily worried about showing somebody up or being like, oh no, I realize that there's a mistake here and blowing that play dead more aggressively than what we saw on Sunday. And I think it's just one of those deals where, you know, you, you don't want somebody to think like, oh man, I'm showing them up. I'm doing this and I'm doing that. It's, it's a matter yeah. of having that comfortable chemistry and that comfortable communication. It's the same as, you know, if it's Super Bowl week and they drop another co-host in here, that's an all-star instead of me with you. Right. I mean, it's not going to be the same. It could be a great co-host, but it's not going to be the same because you, you haven't been working with that person the entire season. And that just makes it different. Um, so I think that that is part of it. And, you know, I understand not wanting to ding somebody for somebody else's mistake when you're on a crew together. But at the same time, the whole oftentimes when you're talking about things like this is greater than the sum of its parts. Right. And when you have everybody comfortable and everybody doing things one way for 18 weeks of a season plus preseason games, then you're not going to have that same kind of comfort and communication when you are working with people that even though you know them, you're not familiar with them on a day-to-day -day or week-to-week, -week, I guess I should say, working yeah. basis. I, you know, I think it's a problematic thing, but I think the next time the contract with officials is opened up, I do think that this should be an issue and this should definitely be discussed. I don't think the PFRA is going to go back and, and, and basically uh, go back against uh, what they won in negotiations without some significant either money increase or, 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 you know, or something like that. That kind of brings us to uh, the second thing, which is full-time officials. And I think this is where I stand on full-time officials. I don't think full-time officials is a bad idea. And although I have come out mostly against it, I don't think it's a bad idea. I do think that it is a 
pretty much a be careful what you wish for situation. And what I mean is this, that the amount of money that, uh, that a top official can make in the game is somewhat shy of like $300,000. So, and everybody said, well, geez, I'd love to have a $300,000 job to work, uh, you know, 18 days a year or whatever. Right. Yeah. And that's the most oversimplistic way that you can look at this. And, and again, look, I don't say this to, uh, you know, to, to blow my own horn. But I wrote a series, uh, ten of geez, it's been ten years now, nine and a half years ago, on a week in the life of an officiating crew. And for people who think that officials don't do a lot during the week for their officiating careers, it's it's foolish. You know, I would I would estimate, I'd estimate that during the week officials work from thirty to thirty five hours a week during the week in season, watching tape and working on their craft in essence. And you might say, well, geez, that's not really a lot, you know, and all that. And that's, it's your right to say that. My only question about full-time, well, two questions. Number one, there's 117 officials in the National Football League. Some of them have jobs that either they love, that's their profession, you know, if you're a lawyer and you're 46 years old and you're making a darn good living being a lawyer, my question is, which profession are you going to choose if told mm -hmm. that, okay, you're a full-time official and we're not going to ban you from doing any legal work, but you can't do any of it in season. Uh, in the off season, the training for your full-time job takes precedent. I'm not saying that that most officials, I don't know what most officials would do if yeah. if if they had to make a choice. I, I can't tell you. The one thing I can tell you is you'd lose some. And a lot of people might say, well, who cares? You know, just officials are a dime a dozen. You can go find them. All right, maybe you think that. But the fact is, what if you lose five referees who are supposed to be the best of the best? And that to me would be the one concerning thing. But my other question is, there's just too many people who think that full-time officiating is going to be a magic pill. Mm -hmm. I, I just, I've never heard any evidence to suggest that watching more tape during the week, that watching more tape in the off season is going to make you better when there's an absolute bang bang play on a field that you have to choose within an absolute split second. Throw a flag, keep it in the pocket. So I don't know. Right. Those are my thoughts about full time officials. Yeah, it it because at the end of the day, officials are still human, and so they're going to be making human decisions on the field, no matter how much training they do or do not have. Right. So when it's you know, you have to decide, and it's a judgment call, whether um, something is roughing the passer or not. How much training is going to help you really decide that when there is that human element of, I have to use my best judgment, whether or not, you know, you are a full-time official or not a full-time official. I don't know. I mean, I think, frankly, the sky judge makes more sense. And we've seen the sky judge concept kind of with expedited review happen throughout the postseason. Now there's some consistency issues with that, but to me, that having the sky judge there and the full-time sky judge makes more sense in some ways than just saying, oh yeah, full-time officials are going to be the magic elixir that's going to solve everything, Peter. I, I don't know what you think about that. Okay, so... I'm glad you mentioned the sky judge because that was going to be my third thing. So there was a play very early in the NFC title game, the long pass from Jalen Hurts to Devontae Smith, uh, in which Devontae Smith made a one-handed catch, went to the ground, and it was clear on replay, seemingly fairly clear, that he either trapped the ball, the ball moved, whatever 
terminology you might want to use it, but um, had that play been examined fully, we would have, I'm pretty sure, seen it become an incompletion, like right away. And I bring that play up because in 2021, this is the second year of this program, the NFL instituted something called replay assist. And in replay assist, the uh, replay official on site at every NFL game has a clear commu line of communication into the referee's ear for the entire game. He can talk to the referee and he can say after a specific play without any challenge flag being thrown, without anything being thrown, he can say that is an incomplete pass. Uh, Devontae Smith actually trapped it. it the ball moved. Uh, you got to call incompletion. Now, mm -hmm. so that's one person. The replay official can do that. Also, Walt Anderson sitting at the officiating command center in New York City in the NFL offices. He also has a line of communication directly into the referee's ear. He can call or he can just literally press a button and he will be connected into the ear of the referee and can say, that's an incomplete pass. Wave that one off to Devontae Smith, okay? And I only mention that to say that right now, the NFL has two insurance policies in every football game for a bad call to be corrected immediately. Neither of those worked on Sunday. Mm -hmm. And Kyle Shanahan, <clears throat> I don't want to say inexplicably, but Kyle Shanahan did not throw the red challenge flag. I want to mention one other thing. So you can you can kind of blame Kyle Shanahan too. Um, but I want to mention one other thing. There is a video system that is in place at every NFL game. It's called the Hawkeye replay system, okay? And the Hawkeye technology, there's this company called Hawkeye, Hawkeye and the technology allows both the, the replay official in the stadium on game day and Walt Anderson to see every uh, replay immediately without it being shown on television. So in other words, say there are, you know, 15 cameras at a game and there were more than that at this game. They could, if they wanted to, go to the Hawkeye technology and immediately look at three or four angles and before the play, the next play begins because there were probably, because you remember in this particular case, the Eagles rushed to the line. Devontae Smith said, let's hurry up. Let's run a play, run a play. And so that doesn't that give you a little bit of, of, uh, of skepticism that he actually made the catch? But, but mm -hmm. anyway, so from the time he made the catch till the time the ball was snapped, I'm guessing there'd be 15 seconds there certainly would be enough time in that 15 seconds. If the replay official and Walt Anderson were both very alert, there would have been time for them to look at, let's say two uh, uh, replays of this play and to see that the ball was trapped, not caught, whatever. That to me indicts both the replay official and Walt Anderson for not being quick enough on the draw. But, the larger issue is the larger issue is the re the if there were a sky judge let's say i mean he's a third person who could do the exact same thing that two people already are charged with doing so yeah. i don't understand the hue and cry to say let's get a sky judge i i think it's 
for me, it's more expanding the replay official in the booth's duties than adding a third person, if that makes any sense. And I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing when you're talking about expanding somebody's duties who aren't on the field, because there is sort of a can of worms that you can open with that as well, where it's, well, if somebody is just looking at things from up on high, how much do they really know about exactly what is happening on the field at any given moment? without it with or without the uh, assist of a replay right so I, that's where it is for me and i guess when you're talking about that particular instance with kyle shanahan you know it's almost like the uh, um the scoreboard operator in philadelphia basically gave an assist to the eagles because he said after the game that i was thinking about challenging it just to see but then i saw a replay and it looked like he caught it so i didn't do it and i don't know if it was that initial replay that the official in the booth and then walt anderson also saw and then they worked quick enough on the draw before the eagles ran their next play um down near the goal line or what but yeah it was it was kind of a failure from a lot of different entities in that particular instance um, because the Eagles got away with something and then they scored a touchdown. Yeah, it's I'm, I'm going to ask you one more officiating question. I don't want to make this all about officiating, all right. but I the one thing that surprised me in the wake of the AFC game were the number number of analysts, including a lot of former players, who said, ticky tack call on Joseph Osai, the Bengals linebacker who pushed um the who pushed Patrick Mahomes uh out of bounds. Now I I have I've got my opinion on this. I haven't heard yours. Let me give you let me get your opinion on that call first. And then I'll I'll tell you what I think. Well, I don't think there was anything ticky tack about it. I mean, you look at different angles of the replay, whatever you want to say. But I mean, it's when I saw it, I initially looked and I said, well, that's 15. I mean, not only did he push him when he was out of bounds, he went into the bench. I mean, and I don't think that it's a matter of it being a quarterback or not. I mean, that could have been Travis Kelsey. It could have been Pacheco. could have been Marquez Valdez, Scantling, Sky Moore, whoever could have caught the ball. And that was actually available for Patrick Mahomes at that point. And if you get pushed that far out of bounds, that's a foul. That's a foul from peewee football, the middle school football, the high school football, the college football, and to the NFL. It's a foul everywhere. So... You know, I think that we can feel compassion for somebody who can make some mistake. And then ostensibly, that's one of the things that causes Cincinnati to in, to lose that game. But that's a foul to me. And I, I thought it was a pretty clear foul, Peter. Okay, so um, here's the way I look at this. I, I started hearing... Um, you know, after the game where the Bengals, there were a couple of Bengals who were not happy with the call. And I heard two things. One, oh, you can't make that call at that point in the game. That, that You can't make a call then that decides the game. Look, I will believe this till the day I die. You have to make the same call in the fourth quarter that you make in the second quarter. If you don't, then it is a horse crap sports event. Period. End of story. Number two, um, I went back on replay. You realize that on replay, it's it's close. It's close, all right? But Patrick Mahomes, when he was contacted by Joseph Asai, had, had already had both feet on the white stripe out of bounds. Yes. And it's arguable that he took a second step with one of the feet. It's very close, as I say. He, it's arguable that he took a second step uh, on, you know, out of bounds with, with one foot before he was contacted. And my only point is, whatever you want to have happen in a game, whether you're rooting for the Bengals or whether you think that it's a ticky-tack call, don't lie about what happened on the play. <laughs> Joseph Asai contacted Patrick Mahomes when he was absolutely unequivocally clearly out of bounds. If you don't yes. think those plays should be called, 
That's a fine opinion to be have. A fine opinion to have. It's wrong, but it's a fine opinion to have. You can have whatever opinion you want, but don't lie and say that that was not uh, a 15 yard penalty. It clearly, unequivocally was. Okay, let's take a break, a mid pod break, before we get into all the other discussions of the week, non officiating category. Let's just take a break and we'll be back on the other side. So happy to be joined by Dean Blandino. And Dean, you're one of the few people with such institutional knowledge who I can get very granular with. And then we can take a 30,000 foot view of officiating in general and talk about what actually might help the situation right now. Um, And I just would like to start by looking at the fourth quarter of the Kansas City-Cincinnati game where kind of all heck broke loose on two specific things. And I want to ask you, let's go in chronological order, okay? First of all, um, with 10 minutes and 36 seconds left in the game, uh, Kansas City has second and nine at their own 34-yard line. And look, for people, I just ask you to be patient because setting the stage for this is important to understand what happened and why it got so incredibly messed up at the point. And I really didn't understand it. I've spent two hours trying to figure it out, talking to various people. And Dean, I want you at any point when I say something that's wrong, I really would like you to interrupt me and say, well, hold on a minute. It didn't happen exactly that way. So here we are, second and nine, 10 minutes, 36 seconds left. Kansas City ball at their own 34. Mahomes throws an incomplete pass and the clock stops. And as it does on an incomplete pass. And at that point, uh, Ron Torbert, the uh, official, uh, spots the ball and he spots it so that it's about a half yard off. Is that how about how you saw it, Dean? Yeah, it looked like that it might have been, it wasn't a lot, but it might have been about a half yard. Yeah. Yeah. So he missed spotted the ball. All right. And so at that point, you know, essentially what happened is it's third and nine and a half. And you can tell looking at the replay, you've got some really angry coaches on the Kansas City sidelines that you could you could see and then you know at that point there's so many mechanisms in place dean that could have fixed this this little miss spotting you've got replay assists where either Walt Anderson wherever he is watching the game or the replay official in the stadium could have been looking at this or quite honestly really any of the alternate officials right at the sure. game because they have alternate officials at a championship game. Um, any of those people could have essentially said, uh, uh, you know, Hey, it, it, you missed spotted the ball, move it up a half yard or whatever. Nobody said anything. And then very late in the process, um, you know, there were nine seconds left on the play clock. I think about, about that time. And it got shut down um, by, I I don't know which official, but, you know, the the play stopped. And then there was a crew conference. Dean, I want you to take me right into that. And then, so we now have basically third and nine and a half at the Kansas City 34. And there's a stoppage. What do you see and what happens? Yeah, so in that situation, obviously, you have an incomplete pass, so you're going to go back to the previous spot, which is basically the line of scrimmage. So I think that was the first misstep where we were off where the ball was placed. At that point, like you said, there's layers in place, replay, the folks in New York, alternate officials. At that point, as soon as the ball's down and we recognize that there's an issue, that's when, and they all have their wireless communication, get on the headset and say, hey, we've got to move the ball up or back, whatever it is. And you want to do that as soon as possible, because what ends up happening is the play clock, like you said, we're inside 10 seconds. 
it's late. We're almost ready for the next snap. And now my, my belief is that it did come from upstairs and they said, Hey, we've got to move the ball. So now we, now we shut down, you know, shut down the, the play clock and we go in, we move the football. And at that point, then, then Torbert makes an announcement that both clocks will start on the ready for play. And then that leads to the next issue um, on the, you know, the third and nine play. So, and so let me explain that. A lot of people will hear that in the stadium. The play clock and the game clock will start on my signal. But the reason why this was a mistake is that the previous play was an incomplete pass. Exactly. The game clock should not have started on his whistle. The play clock, yes, start on his whistle. Okay. And so now you have, and I believe I'm right on this scene, you have, you know, kind of running in probably not as urgently as maybe you should have. Running in is Tom Hill, the field judge at that point, who basically wants to stop the play because he sees that the clock is running and it sure. shouldn't be running. Meanwhile, you know, they, they run in and, and, and then, you know, the Bengals on their sideline are saying, what in the world is going on? And so then they decide that, in essence, they are going to stop the play and allow, you know, allow the the game clock to go back to somewhere around 10 minutes and 30 seconds or something, 1029. But the play is stopped again. Was that correct when Tom Hill went in and did this? It. It's correct in that, like you said, that it was an incomplete pass and the game clock should not have started. But this, to me, this is a bigger issue. And, and this is where we're getting into this. We're getting into this area where, look, I get it. A half yard is important or five or six seconds is important. But when when a team is up on the ball and ready to snap it, is that five or six seconds that we just lost with still a good chunk of time left in the fourth quarter. Is that more impactful than coming in late in the process, trying to shut down the play because yeah, you know, the, the official came in, tried to shut it down. That's a loud stadium. You're not, you know, there was a play earlier. I think it was the first ball start of the game where they, the play went on. They were trying to blow the whistles. That's a loud stadium. It's really hard to get everybody to stop in a situation like that. To me, that five or six seconds is not as critical as ultimately what happened. Now we we kill the play at the end of it, and we basically have a do-over where no one was impacted by that official coming in. And that's where it's a bigger picture question for me. Fixing that ball for half a yard that late into the process, that started kind of the snowball. And now we've got a clock issue. We're trying to correct that. We're trying to be perfect and in that quest for perfection, we end up impacting the game more in a negative way. And that, that's one of those things. I get it from, from Tom Hill's perspective. The clock should not have started. But I think sometimes, and, and Tom Hill is an excellent official, has been around a long time. And I think if you asked him again, he'd probably say, you know what, I should have just let it go and let the play because that five or six seconds is not critical in this situation. Because what happened then on the play is Mahomes threw an incomplete yeah. pass and then they have another do-over. And on the next play, after they have to stop uh, Zach Taylor from flying into orbit, he's so yeah. angry on the other side of the field. Because now what has happened is there was a real incompletion on second down and then a, a fake incompletion on third down. And they're going to have a do-over. And on the do-over, Mahomes gets sacked by B.J. Hill and they call defensive holding on the Bengals. And regardless of whether it was a good or bad call, you can see why the Bengals are going nuts now. No, no question. I mean, it extended the drive. And and that that again, it's those mechanics that sometimes in that situation is just being mindful of, okay, if if they're about to snap the ball, you know, do I really want to come in? At this juncture, I get it. There was 30 seconds left in the game. Yeah, the five or six seconds becomes much more important. But, you know, with, with just under 10 minutes to go, 
Um, that's one where it actually, like I said, has a bigger impact when you try to come in and kill the play and you're not successful in doing that. Dean, just overall, I think we've seen two things that happen in particular on this play that to me would be like maddening, not just if I were the Bengals, but maddening if I were the league office, you know, examining this today uh, in the wake of the game. You're, you're mad that the insurance system put in place, replay assist, Walt Anderson, alternate officials, you're mad that none of those people saw until very, very late the fact that the ball needed to be moved. And then in what was probably, in the immortal words of Marv Levy, an over-officious officiating uh, call uh, by Tom Hill to save, as it turns out, seven seconds on the play, you wonder whether that should have been done. So, so okay, so that's one thing. Now I want to take you to the last minute of the game. Um, I want to ask you about two plays, actually, in the last minute. The first was uh, uh, with 44 seconds to go, Joe Burrow was sacked by Chris Jones. And um, I did not mind that there was no call for a body weight sack okay, or body weight sack. I, I'm not crazy about it. I think it should only be used when it is really – um, you, you know, when it really is an obvious call. But so I didn't mind it. But uh, this in the wake of the game, I think there's some people in Cincinnati and, and otherwise who think that technically this probably should have been called for a body weight sack. How did you or how did you see this? Yeah, I mean, I'm like you. I don't I don't like where we are in this area right now. I, I, I feel yeah. like we 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 have gone into an area where these tend to be just normal tackles and it's just the follow through of a normal tackle where you have two, two or more players going to the ground and there's momentum involved. I did not think that was a foul. I was, I was happy okay. that there was no flag. Um, to me, I've always felt there has to be something additional, you know, a lift, a drive, something extra. Right. And I thought that was just conventional tackle follow through. And, uh, and I, I agreed with, with no call in that situation. Good. All right. That's fine. Um, now let's go to uh, 17 seconds left. Mahomes scrambles around right end. Um, he gets to the Cincinnati 42. He's got both feet on the white stripe, and he's hit. He's not – it isn't It isn't an egregious, sure. you know, killer-type hit. But he's definitely hit when he's out of bounds. And I'm not sure that that the the hit itself, I think it might have been – uh, you know, Mahomes' feet getting caught uh, underneath him that caused it to look a lot worse than it probably really was. But to me, absolutely, it was uh, it was a late hit out of bounds. How did you see it? Yeah, I saw it the same way. I mean, that's one, and those are tough. It's tough on defenders when you're running full speed, and obviously in that situation. Uh, but Mahomes, you know, it wasn't like Patrick was trying to continue to go upfield. He was angling right. toward the sideline. He got out of bounds. Defenders have to let up in that situation. And, and it's unfortunate, but, you know, Joseph Asai, he, he, he gave him a shove out of bounds. Like, I, I agree with you. It wasn't particularly flagrant, but it, it was a foul. He was out of bounds. You've got you've to lay off the runner in that situation because he is out of bounds. And I thought that was, a, you know, that was the proper call um, on, that, on that play. Let's talk about just the three issues We'll go at them one at a time for maybe a minute each. But tell me your feeling about whether all-star crews are good, bad, or indifferent for playoff football. Yeah, and we've gone back and forth over this. I think it's you've got to create a balance. I I like crew continuity throughout the season. I like that communication, officials being able to work with each other throughout the year. There's that comfort level and that familiarity that that helps them as they tr as they go into the postseason. But I also understand not wanting your best officials sitting at home in your biggest games and just because their crew didn't grade out as well. 
um, and that, you know, through no fault of their own. So I think, I think the league is in a good place. I think they look at the crew. They try to keep people together whenever possible, but then you might have underperforming officials on a crew and you don't necessarily want those officials to be working those, those, those big games in, in the postseason. So you can take the, the higher performing officials from other crews and move them in. So I think it's a balance. Um, it doesn't matter, you know, what what the makeup of the crew is. There are games like the two games on Sunday that were just really difficult games to work. And uh, and there's always going to be issues and things like that. So we you know, when we had a crew based system, there were still complaints. So so because we had really good officials that weren't working. So it goes both ways. I think you have to create that balance. Let's talk about the sky judge. <clears throat> yeah. Tell you, tell you how I feel about this. Um, <clears throat> I think a lot of people look at the sky judge as a, a fixer for a lot of ills. And I see two main problems with the sky judge. Number one, you need 17 of them. Who are they? And the reason why everybody's, well, what do you mean? Who are they? Well, <clears throat> you've already, you've got 117 NFL officials. Then you have, um, you know, obviously you have the replay officials. They come from a pool somewhere, either retired officials or people trained or, or whatever. So now you have to find another 17 officials. Where are they going to come from? Are you going to take some off the field to be uh, sky judges? What exactly are you going to do? That's my first problem. Yeah. It's not in, It's not insurmountable. But let me tell you my second problem, and then I'll get your thought. My second problem is very simple. Let's look at the Devontae Smith catch, non-catch in the Philadelphia-San Francisco game downfield where uh, San Francisco defensive back right away is telling Kyle Shanahan, throw the challenge flag, he didn't catch it. Where Devontae Smith is motioning to his team, get to the line, get to the line, you know, let's go. Obviously... It's suspicious. We don't know at that moment if it's not a good catch. And at that time, you have three elements in play. You have the Hawkeye replay video system in every stadium in the NFL. And the Hawkeye system allows both the replay official upstairs and New York to see every angle of that play immediately. You don't have to wait for television to show it to you. So immediately you could look at the camera angle, uh, you know, that is isolated on, uh, you know, on Devonte Smith on that play theoretically and be able to see it pretty quickly. The replay assistant did not uh, say anything obviously into the referee's ear, Walt Anderson, nobody in New York said it. Uh, there was no challenge flag by Kyle Shanahan. And so you had, forget the challenge flag, you had two forms of insurance that had about eight, 15 to 18 seconds to make a decision here. They didn't do it. What makes you think a sky judge is going gonna, is gonna to fix this when you have two insurance policies in place and neither of them fixed it? Your thought about the sky judge? Yeah, I mean, we have a we have a version of a sky judge right now. I mean, this is with with replay assist and these other things that, you know, moving the ball a half yard. I mean, these types of things, that's all, you know, if they went to a sky judge, all of those things would fall under um, that that purview. So it's to me, it's there's a lot of layers immediately you have to recognize like you said the the san francisco player reacting when Devonte smith gets up and he makes that signal i mean every team they have their coach if they're not sure if they caught it or they know that something's you know a little off get up to the blind beat the other team to the challenge beat the replay assist so at that point and you're right with the hawkeye system they have access to all of the individual camera angles but especially a championship game where where Fox Sports probably, you know, might have 25, 30 different cameras, you've still got to pinpoint the right angle. And that takes a little bit of time to pinpoint that right angle. And so obviously they didn't get to that right angle um, in enough time to, to assist. And then it then it falls back on the coach. And this is kind of this. 
this in-between area where, you know, is the coach waiting for a replay assist? Do I throw the challenge flag? And I think replay assist has actually made coaches a little more hesitant in throwing the flag because they're waiting to see, hey, I may save this challenge because yeah. it happened, right? It happened in the in the Chiefs game when they put Mahomes down, um, you know, before he threw the pass. So I think that may be in the back of, you know, Kyle Shanahan's mind, um, you know, am I waiting? And then, you know, once they snap the ball, it, it's too late. But, but again, to your first question, where are we going to get those folks? I mean, there's a pool of people, but to me, it's it's bigger than just finding the right people. It's then finding okay, what what can they what can they assist with? Give us some clear guidelines. Um, is it is it anything that that is just objective, like the ball hitting the ground? Are they going to get into more subjective decisions? Um, things like you know offensive holding or pass interference. You've got to come up with the clear guidelines. What's the standard to correct something on the field, and then train and coach those those people up. Um, and make sure you're applying a consistent standard. And, and I think the NFL is still, the replay assist has been positive overall. I think expedited reviews are positive, but I think they're still finding their way um, as to how, you know, how this is going to work, you know, going forward. Finally, uh, full-time officials, pro, con, would it help? Would it not be that big a deal? What's your view after spending so long in the granular details of officiating? Yeah, I, I don't know. I think full-time officials, I think officials are as full-time as they can be right now without working multiple games a week like other sports do. Uh, but anytime you can spend more, more time looking at video and honing your craft, I think that's a positive. So I'm not against full-time offici officials. I think it could be a positive. Um, I just don't know if full-time officials, if that's going to move, how much that's going to move the needle, how, how much, how much is, and, and how you could even, how you can even quantify that, you know, yeah. you can't, you, you can throw a number that, well, well, we're 97% accurate. Well, that's subjective because your, your, your evaluations are subjective. And so I can't sit here and say, well, they're 95% accurate now. If they're full-time, they'd be 97%. It's impossible to quantify that. I think there would be a there would be a, a PR positive in terms of, well, our officials are full-time. I know coaches, um, you know, team people uh would would want them to be full-time because they're full-time and then they spend so much, so much in 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 their areas. Um so again, I'm not against full-time officials. I think anytime you could spend um, you know, honing your craft, that's positive. I just don't know how much that's going to move the needle. The one thing that I learned was almost 10 years ago now when you were in the NFL chair and you basically green lighted my ability to spend a week with an officiating crew. And I spent a week tailing Gene Steratore and the guys on his crew. And one thing will always stand out in my head. And that is on Wednesday night on that week, I was, you know, I went to a different uh, crew member five different days of that week. And um, on this particular day, I watched uh, Dino Paganelli, who is a back judge, who happens to be the Super Bowl back yeah. judge this year. He is a great official, I think. Um, and, and so I watched him teach school uh, in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And then after school, I watched him because he was a single dad. He was, he was a widower at the time. And I watched him take care of his three kids and all that. And then, I don't know, maybe 9.30, he sat down for two and a half hours to watch tape. And I, I, all, I chuckle at everybody who calls this a part-time job because, you know, Dean, I understand that. It is a part-time job because guys have other jobs and women now have other jobs and I get it. But the thought that they don't spend time 30 hours, 35, maybe 40 hours during the week, somehow, some way, grabbing three hours here, two hours there, spending much of the day Saturday meeting and talking, it, it's, it's silly I, in my opinion. I understand that it's it wouldn't be bad to have them full time, 
But to think that it's the magic pill, I think is really, I, I think it's wrong. Yeah, I, I think it would be an initial, there would be a positive in terms of PR and things like that. Yeah. But then we'd, we'd go right back into, because <laughs> there's going to be games like Sunday. There's going to be, well, then what, they're full time. What's next? I mean, how much more can we can we push it? And and I agree, you know, you just talk about Dino's schedule. Yeah, if, if he didn't have to work another job and he could spend that time focusing, that's a positive. That's a good thing. But then you get yeah. into, there's a lot of different layers if you get into, well, you know, officiating isn't a, you You could be a school teacher for the next 30 years. You don't have to worry about running around and injuries and things like that. So what happens if they get injured? You just have to work through a lot of those things. Not, not insurmountable. But again, I just don't know. It's not the magic pill. It really isn't. But, yeah. but again, anything that can make us better on the field, I think it's a good thing. I'm going to just finish with this that really kind of encapsulates the way I feel about any long involved discussion about officiating in the NFL that, you know, when there was, when it was third and nine at the Kansas city 34 um, it, with 10, 29 left in the fourth quarter and the next, probably the next 10 minutes were some of the angriest minutes I've ever seen coaches get at officials on the field and all the crew conferences, everything like that. Well, you know, at the end of the day, Instead of punting the ball from their own 34, Kansas City punted the ball from its own 40. And the game, honestly, was just simply not affected by what happened in there. And again, I'm not saying that excuses it because it sure. could have been affected. No but question. at the end of the day, the Cincinnati Bengals did not lose this game because of the absolute you know, circus that happened with 10 minutes left in the fourth quarter to me. And I'm not sticking up for a screwed up thing that happened. I'm simply making the point that at the end of the day, we probably need to keep this in perspective. I, I absolutely agree. And I had, I've, I said this before, I've had two separate coaches tell me the same thing in two separate conversations. They said, there's three, three groups that affect games, players, coaches, and officials, they said coaches make the most mistakes, then players and officials make the least. And and but again, but we tend to focus on the officiating mistakes because I think the expectation is perfection, where we don't expect anyone else to be perfect. Dean Blandino, you're the best. I really, really appreciate it. Thanks so much for joining me. Thanks for having me, Peter. So, hallelujah, we're done talking about officiating. <laughs> we're actually going to talk about football a little bit. Um, you know, I think I want to start by something that I think is going to be a storyline in the next week and a half, and that is the Eagles' simple path to the Super Bowl. And look, um, I happen to think that even though the Eagles did have a, a pretty easy path to a Super Bowl, relatively speaking, uh, I don't. I think they are a great football team. Great. And I do not uh, denigrate them because they had the good fortune of playing a very flawed Giants team in the first round of the playoffs and a team that got both quarterbacks hurt in the championship game that allowed them to have a cakewalk into the Super Bowl. That's the way the, the, the coin flips. That's the way the ball bounces. Your thoughts, Miles? Yeah, look, you you play the games on your schedule and you play the teams on your schedule. And the only thing that you have to worry about is winning those games. And the Eagles have done that. And I think that it's, you can say that, yeah, this was a relatively easy path or what have you, but I, I kind of feel like the outcomes would have been the same no matter who they played in the NFC. The Eagles have been a great team all year. Part of it is how adaptable they are on offense. Right, Their offensive line can pass block and they can run block. And Jalen Hurts has done a fantastic job, not just throwing it throughout the season, but of also running it. So 
you know, and he avoids turnovers. It's just that that's how good they've been. And then defensively, their defensive line is dominant because they can rotate guys through like none other. I mean, it's like, oh, Ndamukong Sue's making plays and he's getting quarterback hits. Wow, that's a guy that they picked up in the middle of November. And so that's how deep they are. And that's why they've been successful. So, I mean, I don't have any problem with the way they got there. They're there. And so they deserve to be there, if you ask me. Let's talk for a minute about the Cincinnati Bengals missed chances in the the uh, AFC game. And I don't <clears throat> I don't mean to really criticize the Bengals in this particular case because I do think they made some winning plays in this game. I mean, Joe Burrow made uh, obviously a couple of really good throws early to Tyler Boyd. Uh, made an excellent throw to uh, Jamar Chase. Uh, I, I mean, look, he was, you can tell how many times he's actually thrown the ball to Jamar Chase when you see him throw a deep ball downfield and Jamar Chase either comes back for it or, you know, the chemistry between those guys is great. But his chemistry with T. Higgins and Tyler Boyd is great too. Mm -hmm. I'm not necessarily blaming that so much. I don't necessarily think either that the interceptions, either of the interceptions were were horrible plays by Burrow at all. But I guess I would I would say a couple of things. Miles, I I and I don't know why this happened. Okay. I don't know the reason for this or whether this was an absolute part of the game plan going in or not. But I thought it was odd in this game that Joe Mixon touched the ball 11 times. Mm -hmm. And and again, I'm not faulting, you know, Zach Taylor or, or, or you know, the coaches. And, you know, obviously they, they've, they've got a very good uh, coaching staff, especially, I think, on both sides of the ball. I'm not faulting them, but I am saying that sometimes you probably get out of a game and you say, hmm, Eight carries for Joe Mixon. Eight. And even though, you know, he wasn't breaking a lot, a lot of times, you look at how it's been for Christian McCaffrey a lot this year in San Francisco. You know, bang against the defense, bang against the defense, and all of a sudden the dam breaks. And look, I'm not saying the dam was going to break. I'm not saying anything. All I'm saying is that I didn't like that aspect of it from the Bengals' standpoint. Um... And 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 look, I, I think the one other thing that I would that I would say about this is that I think in a game like this, uh, if if I were Zach Taylor, the other thing I would look at in distribution of the football is eight targets for Jamar Chase. I would want more than that. So in essence, eight carries for Joe Mixon, not enough. Eight targets for Jamar Chase. Not enough. And I can't point to specific things about this that I would say were bad. But if you were going to say to me, well, you know, they really shaded Jamar Chase with a safety, doubled him a lot, I get, I totally get that. I think my feeling about the greatness of Jamar Chase would be the same thing about my feeling uh, with the greatness of, let's say, Justin Jefferson or Cooper Cup, throw it up there and let him try to make a play. And if he can't make a play, he's smart enough to, uh, you know, to punch the ball away so that it's not intercepted. I don't know. I, 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 I'm just curious what you thought of the Bengals on that day. Yeah, you know, I mean, we saw that, though, on the fourth and sixth, right, where it's kind of a do-or-die play, and Jamar Chase is double-covered. And it's not like the coverage was really all that awful, but then, you know, say he doesn't necessarily get his head turned around quick enough, but Joe Burrow has that kind of trust in Jamar chase where it's, you know what, man, I'm going to throw it up and you're going to make a play on it. And I trust you to do that. And it is sort of the same thing that you talk about with the Justin Jefferson, you know, and man, it must've been incredible for Joe Burrow to play with those two guys at LSU where it's like, yeah, I'm yeah. going to throw it up there and you're going to make a play on it. And that's sometimes the thing that you can do with a receiver who's that good is say, you know what? 
I'm going to force the ball to you here because I know that you can make something happen. And it was pretty clear that the Chiefs were going to do everything they could to not let Jamar Chase beat them. But sometimes, I agree with you, Peter, you you might want to force feed him the ball a little bit. And I, I think they did some of that. You know, they got him in the backfield. They were doing some bubble screens. They were doing different things like that. But then when it comes to Joe Mixon, I mean, I don't know if it's kind of game plan um, determined or something like that. But I was looking at snap counts from not just the AFC championship game, but you go back a couple weeks to that wild card round game that they played against Baltimore. Samaj P. Ryan took the majority of the snaps at running back in that game yeah. as well, just as he did against Kansas city. And so there's a part of me that believes that Cincinnati knew they were going to struggle a little bit running the football against the strength of that particular defensive line. Whereas you go back a week and in that Buffalo game, Joe Mixon has over a hundred yards. They figured that they were going to be able to dominate Buffalo's front and they were able to do that. So I, I think that there's some give and take that goes into it that way. You know, after that fourth and six play you referred to on the first, that happened on the first play of the fourth quarter, mm -hmm. fourth and six at the Kansas city 41 and instead of just trying to eke out a first down, Burrow went for it and he down the left side of the line. And I remember watching that play. I said, no, Joe, don't do this. Because, <laughs> uh, you know, obviously Jamar Chase was well covered, but he found a way to do it. In the last 14 minutes and 50 seconds of this game, Jamar Chase was targeted one time by Joe Burrow. Wow. I don't know. I just don't like it. I don't, I just don't mm -hmm. like it. So anyway, that's, that's that. I want to say something about two players on Kansas City coming out of this game. I covered the game. After the game, I was waiting to talk to Patrick Mahomes, and I was in this little ante room off the family room where uh, Kansas City's players meet and greet their families after the game. So I was waiting in there, and there was uh, <clears throat> Marquez Valdez Scantling was in there. Uh, and as I waited, there was one other, there was one other player in there. And I looked up, and I just had to say, I, I mean, this is going to sound almost fanish, but the other guy in the room was Chris Jones. And I looked up at him, and I said, hey, Chris, you played a fantastic football game. And I, I'm sure that sometimes you get a little bit overshadowed and all that stuff, but man, you were great today. And, you know, he was thankful and all that stuff. But, you know, there was one other guy, and obviously, so Chris Jones, to me, he is the only guy in this game right now who approaches the greatness of Aaron Donald. And he's not yes. far away. But, I mean, Aaron Donald, I do think, is a singular player. But Chris Jones was absolutely great. Here's the other guy in this game. And you look at him. He didn't have great numbers. He didn't have... He, he, he wasn't a guy who you say, ah, oh, they won the game because of Isaiah Pacheco. Mm -hmm. Isaiah Pacheco is a damn good football player who, for as long as he can hold up, and he's not a big guy... He runs pissed off, you yes. know, and he runs with some excellent athleticism. And Miles, I don't know if you remember this play, but in the second half, you know, he runs a little kind of wheel route slash flat pattern out of the backfield. And uh, when he's on his way out, he has to, he has to chip uh, Trey Hendrickson, you know, the uh, Cincinnati defensive end. Uh, edge guy and he doesn't just chip him he throws his body into Trey Hendrickson and Hendrickson is like you know he just kind of goes back like this and the incredible part of the play is that then Burrow throws the ball to Isaiah Pacheco for a completion Pacheco starts running upfield and lo and behold here comes Trey Hendrickson catching Isaiah Pacheco uh, with an incredible hustle play. Both those guys, tremendous admiration for both of them. Because you say, honestly, 
that a running back, oh, he doesn't get paid to block, you know, and all that. But I can tell you this, you play for Andy Reid's team, you make a play like that, you'll be on Andy Reid's team forever. I mean, unless your financial demands get out of sight. Right. But that to me, I just really love this player. I don't know. Yeah. And Miles, I've been so impressed with him. Fourth round kid from, or seventh round kid, obviously, oh, yeah. from Rutgers. Uh, I, I mean, I'm just wowed by him. I don't know. Open the floor to you for comments on either Jones or Pacheco. Well, it's funny because, you know, you talk about Pacheco, you know, and being from Rutgers, I don't know, maybe he's just got that Jersey swag, you know, that comes with going to a school there. But <laughs> I remember in the, in training camp and really going even back to the off season program, you know, folks I know from Kansas city kept talking about this guy. Oh man, Isaiah Pacheco. I don't know if it's really going to translate yeah. when the regular season starts, but Hey, he's got some ability to him and you know, whether or not it was because of the injury to Clyde Edwards, Alaire, he ends up as their leading rusher this year. And frankly, he looks like a better player than Clyde Edwards, Alaire ever has in that system. He does no I, question I mean, about it. Just, yeah. He plays with such physicality and the way that he lowers his shoulder when he runs and he finishes off runs. You are always going to feel Isaiah Pacheco whenever he has the football. And that's exactly the kind of thing that Kansas City needs in that offense. And so, I mean, what a find by Brett Veach and his staff to pick up uh, Isaiah Pacheco in the seventh round because that is, if Kansas City goes on to win the Super Bowl, that's going to be a key player in this thing. I, I have no doubt about that. You know, I found myself uh, asking the question to a couple of people after this game, a couple of Kansas City people. And they talked about, well, you know, Clyde Edwards-Hilaire, more complete running back, more accomplished running back, um, and, and all that. And I just started thinking to myself, I, I mean, watch the games. Yeah. Clyde Edwards Hilaire is not better than Isaiah Pacheco. And I don't care that one was drafted, whatever, what, 32nd, and the other mm -hmm. was drafted 250th, whatever it was. I mean, Isaiah Pacheco is a better football player than Clyde Edwards Hilaire. It's like somebody last year criticized me for saying Tony Pollard is better than Ezekiel Elliott. And I said, you know, a long time ago, I heard Paul Zimmerman say in a Pro Football Hall of Fame voters meeting, I heard Paul Zimmerman say, do you, do you watch the games? Do you, have, do you watch the games? And oh, if man. you watch the games, you can see, and I forget what the argument was, this guy is better. This guy plays better than the, than the other guy we're talking about, whatever the discussion was. I heard him say it 50 times. Did you watch the games? Just watch the games and you'll see X. I don't know how anybody watches the Kansas City Chiefs play and says that Clyde Edwards Hilaire should be playing ahead of Isaiah Pacheco. I mean, or Jarek McKinnon for that matter. It's a, it's a <laughs> yeah. Well, I really like Jarek McKinnon, and I do yeah. think that uh, I do think that in an NFL game and in a good NFL offense, you need multiple backs. And yes. so I don't, I don't have, I don't find fault with Jarek McKinnon. I think he's a really, really good all around player. But right now on first down in Kansas city, my running back guys is Isaiah Pacheco. We're going to get to three other quick topics before we, we finish number one. So I find myself wondering now what to do if you're the 49ers, mm. you, you almost have to let Jimmy Garoppolo go seek his fortune and play somewhere, whether that's the Jets. Uh, I, I, I mean, look, we can debate Jimmy Garoppolo. We can do that on our March 18th pod. Okay, <laughs> but yes. I, think, I think the one thing I would say now after seeing uh, this poor Brock Purdy go down with his fluky elbow injury, and now he's going to miss everything until training camp, which is... To me, for this guy, it's really sad because now in the off season, I think, I think that Trey Lance will take every snap or the vast majority of snaps uh, for the 49ers. So now that that changes how you go into 
training camp and who wins this job. That's number one. But number two, what I really think this does, the injury to Brock Purdy, is that it opens the door for Tom Brady. And I'm not saying that to try to be, uh, you know, obnoxious or or headliney or anything like that. But I believe that there are those inside the 49ers who had tremendous regret mid and late season 2020 watching what Tom Brady was doing in Tampa, knowing that he was dying to be the quarterback of the 49ers. And if you're the 49ers, you say now, well, maybe we need to open the door to Tom Brady just as an absolute bit of insurance. And so I kind of look at it like if I were the 49ers, if I'm John Lynch right now, and the story is true that Brock Purdy is going to need surgery and will need six months, I think I would definitely investigate and kick the tires on Tom Brady. I would too. I mean, we know that Tom Brady is not, you know, the Tom Brady that he was five, six years ago. Sure. But is the person who was leading the league in completions, and I believe just set a completions record, you know that Tom Brady has still some ability left, right? And we also know that that system that Kyle Shanahan runs is very quarterback friendly. So you also put surround him with weapons of a Christian McCaffrey, Debo Samuel, Brandon Ayuk, George Kittle, the list goes on. There's no reason why Tom Brady could not be successful there. Now, the other thing about this too, is we still don't know what Trey Lance is or what he's going to be. I mean, he played a couple times as a rookie. He was okay. You know, he was in a monsoon in Chicago and then got hurt in the second game against Seattle. So we just, we have no clue who Trey Lance can be as an NFL quarterback. Yeah. And I mean, you know, eventually you're going to have to decide on his fifth year option. And, you know, frankly, who knows what's going to happen there. So you just, there's a lot that's still up for discussion with Trey Lance. And I think he could, he could be a good pro. He might also be a bust, but we just don't know. But I think giving him the opportunity to learn behind somebody like Tom Brady for a year, maybe two years. I don't know that that's really going to hurt him. And especially because you can't necessarily have the competition in the off season program, as you would probably like to have, if you're the 49ers between yeah. Trey Lance and Brock Purdy. And it just, the Brock Purdy injury does change a whole lot for this landscape of the 49ers 2023 off season and then regular season as well. You made a pun there, Miles. The landscape. <laughs> uh, I didn't even notice. Poet and Very I Very nice. It. Very <laughs> nice. Um, all right, Miles, let's spend a minute and really not much longer on the coaching, various coaching situations. It appears, and that's one of the reasons why I don't want to do that much on it, is that by the time you listen to this, D'Amico Ryans might be the coach of the Houston Texans. I mean, it, it appears that that's where that is headed. Uh, and, and so you don't know who's going to get what job and all that. But I do want to ask you, you had some strong opinions on Twitter about the fact that, um, you know, in Carolina, they went with Frank Reich uh, over the, uh, the incumbent in this job. And I want you to take me through your thought process on Steve Wilkes inheriting uh, an inferior team, going six and six, having the rampant support in the locker room to get in the job and then not getting the job. I, I just, I feel like it's bothersome. And, you know, as a black man in America, I watch what Steve Wilkes has done as a head coach, both in Arizona, where he did not have the support of his general manager for the beginning of the season because he was suspended for getting popped for an extreme DUI. And then you go three and 13 with Josh Rosen as your quarterback and Sam Bradford too, by the way, at the beginning of the season, who was playing on basically no knees. What chance did he have? And then you go and you are the interim coach before the Carolina Panthers and David Tepper says, well, you do an incredible job. You'll be considered for it. And the reports out of the Panthers are that not only did, well, first of all, we saw what he did, right? 
I mean, you're talking about quarterbacks with Baker Mayfield, PJ Walker, and Sam Darnold, neither of whom should be a starting quarterback in 2023 you still go six and six you're on the brink of a division championship albeit under 500 but still you know this is not the plan that steve wilkes had coming into the season he basically shifted the entire defense by getting rid of phil snow and putting in al holcomb as defensive coordinator and you still are able to get success and yet you lose out to this job to somebody who was fired in favor of jeff saturday and it's like, I mean, we could, I, I don't want to take shots at Frank Reich because this really doesn't have that much to do with Frank Reich. You know, it's Frank Reich, I think is a good coach. And I understand that he has a history of being a quarterback and of lifting quarterback performances. But if you look at what Steve Wilkes did as a leader of men, right, with a plan that was not his own going into the season, and you contrast that with Jeff Saturday who also was an interim coach who got there. Yes. In the middle of the season, but again, Steve Wilkes did not arrive with the Carolina Panthers in this stint that he was there until that particular off season. And Jeff Saturday goes one and seven and loses the greatest comeback in NFL history because of, as a team that gives up 33 points in the fourth quarter to the Dallas Cowboys. And he's still considered a finalist for this job for the Indianapolis Colts. And yet Steve Wilkes, probably was not a finalist for the job for the Carolina Panthers. I don't know how that can't bother you. It just, it bothers me. And, you know, yeah. like I said, Frank Reich, I think, I think is, is a good coach, yeah. but it's just bothersome that like you yeah. just look at it and you're like, man, what's he got to do? <laughs> yeah, I think, and look, it's pretty notable that here we are uh, on day five after it was announced that he was getting the job. And I don't know when the Panthers are going to talk about it. It's pretty weird to uh, announce that you're hiring Frank Reich and don't say anything on Friday. Don't say anything other than that you hired him. You say nothing Friday, say nothing Saturday, say nothing Sunday. Obviously, you don't want to compete with the games. Okay. You say nothing sure. Monday. Or are you going to say something today? I mean... I believe Tuesday is the press it's conference. It's a little... Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's just, I don't know. To me, uh, it just, it doesn't seem right. But I think the larger thing is, if I were David Tepper and I made this announcement in midseason when I was getting rid of one coach and putting another in an interim state, I think I would have probably said, listen, uh, I'll be honest with you, I am going to lean toward an offensive coach when we hire a full-time coach. I haven't made that decision final. Uh, Things can happen. My opinion can change. But in today's football, we need a guy who is going to make sure that we coach the quarterback well, blah, blah, whatever, whatever. Right. Because look, all along, that's what David Tepper has wanted. Exactly. You know, he's wanted the next Sean McVay or whatever, whatever you'd call it. Or or he's wanted a guy who is going to develop and nurture and have great quarterback play, which he hasn't had since in the limited time he's been the owner. I guess overall what I would say is if if somehow Jeff Saturday gets the Indianapolis job, I mean, I, if I were a black coach in the National Football League, if I were Eric Bieniemy, who I believe is a finalist or something, whatever the term is, you know, he has been interviewed for that job and has been told that he's still involved with it. Um, if I were one of those coaches, I would say, you guys make up whatever rules you want to make so that the white guy always gets the job. Mm-hmm. I mean, how else would you feel if you were a black coach seeing Jeff Saturday get that job? A totally inexperienced person in coaching uh, getting the job over many more people who have, who have had coaching careers yes and in great settings with great coaches so all i can say is if the indianapolis colts do that and i have no idea what they're going to do they're still in fact finding the colts deserve every bit of protest that would come along with it and the nfl deserves obviously to be hit with brick bats as well but Let's just, let's wait and see what happens. And let's wait and see what happens at the end of this process. 
uh, because obviously we're in the middle of this process right now. We don't know where it's all going to end. But anyway, we'll see. Listen, we have got to, we're, we're like, we're, this is becoming the 90 minute pod every week. I, I don't really want to do that. But, you know, we just start talking and things happen and we go and we go and we go. But anyway, Miles, thanks a lot. I'm going to see you in Phoenix. Uh, we'll have a nice discussion. Hopefully we'll break bread at some point and uh, we will try to bring you something that you don't know from the most covered and hyped sports event on the planet every year. So uh, the Peter King podcast presented by Salesforce will be back next week from Phoenix. Hope everybody has a good week. You know, there's no football this week other than, you know, some of the all-star games, and senior bowl and all that. It's not a big problem if you actually want to say, read a book this week. That's good. That's healthy. But have a great off week between games. Miles and I will see you again from the Super Bowl in Phoenix. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.